Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics Podcast. Today we have on Dr. Alicia Jackson, who is the C- founder and CEO of Ever Now. And we are really excited to talk to you about a recent report that came out on menopause and symptoms. But first, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here and to talk about our recent data and also what we're doing to try to just move women's health care forward. Well, Ever Now is a telemedicine company focused on menopause. And we actually first met you at Stacy London, had a recent event for CEOs of different menopause brands. And you were on the panel speaking about a recent report that you had done. And Bridget and I kind of perked up and went, oh, research, because it's so hard to find quantitative research for menopause symptoms. And you have over 100,000 clinically validated health profiles in this report. How did you get that number? Well, let's first start off. What is the report? (laughs) Yeah, Um, we have a couple of reports. I think the one that you're referring to is our most recent one where we actually looked at the impact of race and ethnicity on menopausal symptoms and women's health. Um, all of these, um, health profiles have come through women who've come to ever now and filled out our health intake, um, you know, trying to find out if they're eligible for treatment via ever now and then what might work for them. Um, so we've been collecting this data since we first started in early 2020. Um, my background is a PhD scientist. And so when I, first learned about menopause, one, I barely knew anything. And then number two, as I started to dig in, um, I found two things, which is one, just as you said, this area is drastically under-researched. It is very much misunderstood as it is much of women's health and especially women's health after the age of 45. It's very underrepresented and I don't think it's well understood by most physicians and even women's women themselves about how much their health changes as they're going through the perimenopausal and menopausal transition. Um, And so, you know, just bringing it back as to why I started ever now, which was looking at this lack of data on women's health, especially going through menopause, looking at, you know, the gap that women have in finding really great care, evidence-based care. Um, I just didn't even have a choice but to start, one, a company that could make sure that women could get access to the care that they needed, and one that could really provide that care and access across the entire United States. But then number two, I personally, given my background, immediately said, look, if we have all these women coming to our platform, let's make sure that whatever data and knowledge that we gain, we can put it back out to the research community so that we can point out areas where we need more investment, more knowledge, more kind of research being done on women's health. And so we have two studies out. The first study we released uh, roughly, probably the first version over a year ago, was just a broad study looking at every single woman who'd come through the platform and finding and finding different insights. So for example, we found that definitely the symptoms of perimenopause differ greatly from the primary symptoms that women are having during the, the menopausal transition. You find a lot more things like anxiety, mood swings happening during perimenopause. While in menopause, you see the canonical or you know well-known symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. Um, The most recent study that we just put out, the one looking at race and ethnicity, is a study of nearly 45,000 women that that have come through our platform. And we looked at how symptom severity and even presence of symptoms varied by racial background. And what we found was that Black and Hispanic women consistently had far more severe symptoms, things like hot flashes and night sweats, vaginal dryness, than our kind of typical, I shouldn't even say typical, we used we Caucasian women as our reference because that's typically where most of the most of the data comes from. However, we also found that East Asian women have far less severe symptoms. Um, and so immediately that starts to bring up questions as to why. And one of the things that has always been thought was, oh, maybe it's linked to BMI. 
Um, but when we corrected for that, we didn't see that BMI actually explained these differences in symptoms that we're seeing. Um, and so now this raises a bunch of other questions. And so, like I said before, now we can put this out to the research community and folks can, other scientists and researchers can start to dig in more as to why we're seeing these differences in symptoms. Um, as to why I am so invested in this research is that we know that if you have very severe hot flashes and night sweats, like we're seeing in the Black and Hispanic populations, we know that you are 70 to 80% more likely to have a cardiac event. And so if we're seeing a population where we are seeing more severe symptoms, these women need to ensure that they're being counseled to go seek out care for their cardiovascular health because they are, are at higher risk. Um, would someday I would love to be able to treat all these women, but at the very least, let's make sure that women are getting the type of health care that they need. It's not just about an acute hot flash. It's about their long-term health, their long-term cardiac health that they're seeing. And I think a lot of women probably don't even know, but um, at this stage of life, you are seven to eight X more likely, seven to eight X uh, uh, times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than of cancer. Um, and I don't think most women know that. And I really, really want women to understand this because also how it manifests is very different than how it manifests in men. Um, so I'll pause there. That was a lot of information. <laughs> but that, yeah, I was, you know, what you were saying there would answer the questions I was going to ask. Cause I, I said, I was thinking we were talking about the cardiovascular issues that women's cardiovascular health, their symptoms when they're having a heart attack or condition are not the same usually as what a man no. is having. No, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah. Well, I was going to say a very close mentor and friend of mine, um, the woman who actually married my husband and, and me just recently had a heart attack and her husband's a physician. And for the entire week before she realized she was having a heart attack, oh, I'm just tired. I've been running myself really hard or I lifted too heavy of a weight at the gym. And she was just making excuse after excuse. And finally her, her physician said, I need you to come in right now and get blood work. And she did. And they, she was in the operating room an hour later. Um, it's, it's really just incredible. You know, a woman who's even her own husband is a physician didn't know she was having heart attack. What, what did the blood work tell her? I was curious about the blood work. What was um, the indicator? You know, I want to be careful. It just had yeah. the biomarker for have that, that you were, she had heart damage that she was okay. actually having a heart attack. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, she's 52. She's in wow. great health. Um, exactly. All of us are thinking, oh my goodness. That right? could have been any of us. Right. Could have been any of us. And so I, I, I just think it's this hidden, it's this hidden killer of women, um, that, that many of us just don't think about because we, you know, when you're young, you just think, ah, my heart's really healthy. I'm really good. Women, women are healthier than men when it comes to heart health, but it turns out postmenopausal, that may not be as true as we thought it was. Well, we've noticed some of the research also um, from NAMS coming out on mm -hmm. cardiovascular health and yes. vasomotor symptoms with yes. hot flashes. And if I recall correctly, the more severe in perimenopause that you have hot flashes, it increases the likelihood you're going to have cardiovascular issues. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, that does seem to be true. Wow. Yeah. But, you know... Only I was reading the report and only half of the perimenopausal women experience hot flashes, which you always think, oh, I know I'm going through perimenopause or menopause because I start to actually have hot flashes, but mm -hmm. it actually can be the fatigue and the low energy. Can you talk about some of the perimenopausal symptoms that come mm -hmm. up first that women aren't aware of? Yeah. Let me just, just give me one moment so I can sure. make sure I'm speaking accurately. Um, cause I love, I love talking about this. Um, so do we, <laughs> I know, right. We have, I could spend like half a day doing this. Uh, it's just, it's just deeply interesting. And, and there's so little education out there, you know, as I said, I, so I have a nine-year-old son and, you know, he has a book called it's so amazing. And it's all about going through puberty and all the changes that happen to your body. There is no, it's so amazing for women going through menopause. You know, he has it memorized and he's nine. 
but he at least knows when it happens. It's not going to be like a big surprise why he's like growing hair. Um, but I think for, for many women, it is a big surprise and we just assume it's something else that's happening. All right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what we see in women who are going through perimenopause. Um, because a lot of times women are not tuned into, oh, this is a symptom of perimenopause, especially because it is, if we look at the major symptoms we're seeing, it's sleep disruption, it's brain fog, it's fatigue it's weight changes, mood swings, and anxiety and depression. And if you just think about where you are in your 40s, um, you have aging parents, you probably have children, and you also just had COVID going on. And so every single one of those symptoms, you could attribute to something else going on in your life. Like, yes, of course I'm exhausted because I'm driving my kid to school. We all just got over COVID. Um, I, I'm worried about my parents, um, you know, because my dad's in the hospital again, and you can just lift, list every single symptom there. And actually, that's what we find for most women is we just attribute it to something else going on in our life and don't stop to think, wait, I'm in my 40s. And um, turns out it might be that my hormones are also starting to fluctuate quite a bit and decline. And that might be that may not, they may not be the cause of everything that's going on, but it's definitely not helping. And it's probably exacerbating how I'm feeling. Exactly. You know, we hear that so much. And I tell my personal story that I didn't even know what perimenopause was when I was going through it. And so many women don't know what it is. I had heard of menopause, but not peri. And what do you think we could do to make sure that more women, like I know, just to let them know about this, what are some things we can do to get the word out? I think there's two things. One is I think there just needs to be a massive education of the of of the whole medical system. Um, because women are a lot of women are still going to see their doctors for their annual PAP, well women exam. Um, and that's just an opportunity for a doctor to check in and say, look, I'm not saying you're going through perimenopause, but you're in your 40s. It's going to be super normal if you start experiencing these things. And oh, by the way, if the, if it's something that's bothering you, we can do something about it pretty easily. Um, and then I think number two is exactly what you were doing here, which is just putting out information and education into channels that women are going to hear and at least be aware of it. And the more that we talk about it and we also get you know, just women at every different aspect of society talking about it, everyone from, you know, if we get the first lady to talk about it, great. If we get a celebrity to talk about it, great. And if we get somebody local at your, you know, your local church to talk about it, that's great too. All of those touch points are really important for women. And so that they're hearing it in multiple places. Well, I think also it, it's the fact that I was reading on maybe four or five months ago when you whenever now received a lot of seed money from mm -hmm. names like Gwyneth Paltrow and Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz and Demi Moore, all the women who are either coming up in the demographic, like Drew Barrymore is just starting into that to Demi mm -hmm. Moore, who's just coming into post probably. Exactly. Why do you think that this is, I know it's because they're going through it, mm -hmm. but why do you think all of a sudden it's resonating so much in communities? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I have a few different theories, which is, at least in the startup community, people tend to start businesses um, at the age at which they're experiencing um, something. So for example, you saw like a whole rush of food delivery companies, and then you see a rush of parenting apps and, you know, maternity apps. And um, now we're seeing this growth of menopause apps, right? Because we have a group of entrepreneurs who are aging up into near that perimenopause, menopause age. So I think that's something kind of from the startup community. Um, number two, I think it's growing out of um, definitely the generation, probably I would say the millennials, really are becoming much more open about talking about their bodies when it comes to um, everything from fertility to their periods. I mean, this was something I didn't talk about when I was a kid. 
um, not very openly at all. And it does seem to be that we're just becoming much more open about normal aspects of women's bodies and what we're going through. And so maybe this is just the natural outcome of, well, if we're talking about every other aspect of a woman's reproductive cycle, maybe we should be talking about the latter half of that life cycle, which is it's not just about when your period starts, it's also about when your period ends. Um, and so that's the other narrative or hypothesis that I have there. Well, as someone who has six days prior to my menopause celebration day, six days, I'm just fingers crossed that Aunt Flo does not come to visit me in the next <laughs> six days. Um, I can say that I have noticed, and what I thought was interesting in your report is as I get closer to the date of technical menopause, some of my symptoms are better than they were. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like my migraines, and I'd like to say the brain fog, but it just, I think it's a permanent, the weight gain and the, and the brain fog just don't go away. Uh, but I have noticed an improvement and, and I saw in your research that it's, it's like a bell curve, like the forties you start and then the fifties you yeah. hit, and then mm -hmm. the sixties, you start to go down. Are you finding a lot of the patients that you're following through on this research are seeing improvements after the actual date of menopause? They are, but also realize most of the women that we're tracking are also now on treatment. Um, so it's a little different, but the reason that you see that improvement is um, during perimenopause, it's not like a nice smooth decline of your hormones. It, there's a lot of up and down because, because essentially your brain and your ovaries are having a conversation and your ovaries are kind of stopping responding to your brain signals. And so your brain is like yelling louder and louder at your ovaries. And sometimes they're waking up and doing the thing that they should. And sometimes they're not. So that's why you're getting that big fluctuation in hormones throughout your body, which is why obviously you have a fluctuation in symptoms because all of your control centers have these nice estrogen receptors and other hormonal receptors on them. And you can imagine if sometimes they're being hammered on and sometimes they're being starved, you're going to have very different um, responses. Um, and so as you start to enter into menopause, a lot of that fluctuation levels out. Now, you're still in some ways starving those receptors of estrogen, which is why you're still seeing some of the symptoms that you are, especially things like brain fog, because we know that estrogen is important for brain metabolism. And number two, you're also getting the weight gain um, because we know that estrogen is important for insulin regulation. We're not certain why, but what we do know is that women going through the menopausal transition enter often enter a state of insulin dysregulation. And that's why you see this canonical kind of gain of weight around the stomach. And we know from, for example, the SWAN study, the rate of fat accumulation will double during the menopausal transition. And that's why every single woman says, I'm exercising, I'm eating like I always did, and I'm gaining weight. And it's like, yes, you are, because your metabolism has changed. It has changed. And it's not you or your behavior. It is literally your body metabolism has changed. Um, and so that presents a real struggle for so many women and is incredibly frustrating, especially if you have somebody telling you, well, just exercise more and eat less. And we have women who come in and say, I run five miles a day and I'm eating like 1200 calories and I'm still gaining weight. And you know, that's, that's just bananas. Um, and so they, they really do need another form of help if you want to try to adjust your metabolism. Yeah, and, and that just attributes back to the anxiety, back to the depression. It's just <laughs> the a sleep, vicious, all of it's that. A vicious, the sleep, the vicious cycle. Hopefully. And yeah, and then you you talked about the hormone and so menopause hormone um, therapy. Yes. And, and can you talk a little bit? I know that um, you talked about how that a lot of women in your study that has been helpful. And can mm -hmm. you share just a little bit about the different types of hormones with our mm -hmm. listeners and yes. just different options that are out there? Yes. So when we, when we started ever now, we did decide to focus, um, given my background, scientist, PhD on, on evidence-based treatments. And we started with hormonal therapy because that is the gold standard. Um, there is nothing that can even touch the effectiveness of hormonal therapy, um, not all women can take it. Not all women want 
pay it. But for those women who are qualified for it, for whom it is safe and effective, it is an incredible um, help to both her acute symptoms and long-term health. Um, and so um, the types of hormonal therapies that are available out there are forms of estrogen. Um, and that is the primary one. Um, you can get the one that's very similar to the one that your ovaries produce, which is called estradiol. And then there's different synthetic forms of estrogen that's often found in things like birth control. Um, when we're talking about hormonal therapies, the gold standard is to give someone estradiol. That is the bioidentical form of estrogen that your ovaries produce. You can take it in two different forms. You can take it in a topical form. So that can be a patch, a cream, a gel, a spray, or you can take it in an oral form, which is a pill. Um, in general, we prefer the transdermal form. Through, so through the skin, we primarily like to prescribe the patch. However, we can prescribe any of the other forms. Um, and why we like it is that when you absorb it through the skin, it doesn't pass through your liver. And so all the clotting factors and any risk associated with that is decreased. Um, so that's our number one thing we prescribe. And the majority of women that we treat are on estrogen, um, estradiol, the patch. Um, for women who still have a uterus, we also prescribe the bioidentical form of progesterone, which is progesterone. Um, that's just an oral pill. You typically take it in the evening because it turns out it also helps you to sleep. And what this helps is that if you are taking estradiol, it often thickens your uterine lining. And when you're, when you're, um, having your period, what happens is that every month you naturally just flush that uterine lining out. However, if you're no longer getting a period and taking estrogen, we just don't want that uterine lining to overgrow. And so you take progesterone to help prevent that overgrowth. Um, there's another form of hormonal therapy that some doctors prescribe for certain women, and that's testosterone. We don't prescribe that right now. Um, it can be helpful for women um, who are having certain forms of sexual dysfunction. Um, and there's a pretty simple test that you can take for that. Um, one of the challenges in the U.S. is that we don't have a form of testosterone that's FDA approved for women to take. It's about one tenth the dose of what um, a man would take topically. Um, and so often women need to find it in a compounded form. Um, you can work with your doctor to find out if you are eligible for that and then work to find a really high quality compounding pharmacy that does test all of their um, products that they produce and that would be safe to take. But those are, those are the three main forms of hormonal therapy today. And I noticed in your report, as you were following several of the women who started within three or four months, they're seeing significant improvement in their symptoms. Correct. And not everything improves at the same rate. I will say that if you are on an adequate dose of hormonal therapy, by four to six weeks, you should be starting to feel something. We start to already see improvement within, within a month. And then you'll typically see full improvement by three to four months. Um, over the majority of your symptoms. And so that you also talk about um, smoking hmm. and how it can affect, can you talk uh, a little bit about the damaging effects of smoking during menopause? Yeah, what we found with smoking is that there is a significantly increased prevalence of severe symptoms for women who are smoking. And this, um, this holds um, across all demographics. It holds across all ages. And the reason that we believe that it increases your menopausal symptoms is that it's due to underlying inflammation. Um, and um, so none of this should be surprising to anyone, but it really is that inflammation that we're seeing that seems to compound and increase your symptoms. So if you are a smoker, the very first thing you probably want to do is quit smoking. And that will definitely help you in terms of reducing those symptoms. And there's so many good products out there now, um, different nicotine patches and gum that can help you get there. You were also talking about uh, the poster. There was a poster for NAMS that yeah. was recently had come out and it was about ethnic differences. Can you share a little bit about that? 
Yeah, let me let me pull that up really quickly. Um, and we can also share it if you want to share it in your in your oh, material for women. That to look would be at. great. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And we're actually doing another run through of the data. We have a, a bit larger data since that since we published that and have some really, really interesting data, for example, oh, cool. on Southeast Asian women, on indigenous peoples. Um that that I just find fascinating because it, it is interesting about why are we seeing these differences across different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, have you found so, why the have you found why it seems that East Asian women do not have the same severity and symptoms? Is it diet, life like you? This this is like the question I'm so interested in, and and I'm very interested in it because. Let's go back to smoking. We know that smoking increases symptoms. We also know that higher BMI increases symptoms. And that that's actually something that most, a lot of med students were taught, um, were not taught that. They were taught that women with higher BMI should have lower symptoms because fat produces a form of estrogen called estrone. However, that's not at all what we've found. And it's it's quite consistent now that the higher BMI, you will have far more severe symptoms. So that also leads us, that also gives us another tool here, which is we know that losing even small amounts of weight can help, can help um, uh, kind of soften a lot of the symptoms that you might be having. Um, and so if you're thinking about this, what we know um, from both the weight study and the smoking study is that it is very likely that inflammation is driving a lot of the symptoms. And so maybe something to start to look at is what's is it underlying inflammation state of these different backgrounds that's driving the symptoms? Is there something in diet? Is there something in lifestyle or maybe just underlying kind of biological differences in inflammation state that's resulting in different manifestation of symptoms. Um, and this is something I'm just really, really interested in digging into, especially because it starts to give us more tools to be able to treat not only the underlying symptoms of menopause, but also the longer term health effects, because we know, for example, inflammation drives cardiovascular disease. And so already, can we think about, you know, having a, a special, let's say diet and nutrition program focused on a low in, you know, putting your body into a low inflammation state that can not only remediate your symptoms, but also um, re remediate or, or de decrease your risk of longer term health effects. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I'm very, very excited about, which is it starts to, it starts to give us clues as to what are some other tools we can have. And that's, that's so interesting. interesting. I was going to say oh, Dr. Yeah. Moday. No, cause we, yeah. we interviewed, um, Dr. Moday recently and she wrote a book mm -hmm. on the immunotype and mm -hmm. Bridget and I both fell into the smoldering inflammation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. and there were like yeah. four different types and there were types growth. and yeah, that was it. And so it's interesting too, because, you know, as you were entering this menopause, prairie menopause, post-menopause phase, and you do, you would get that weight gain, you get that middle, whatever the middle, middle, and, and then it's more difficult to lose the weight. So that's another thing. It's like, yeah. there, you know, any suggestions out there, yet to figure out what can we do to control this weight gain when our metabolism has gone, you know, where things have gone down, the estrogen's gone down. So that's another, just a whole nother part of it. Totally. Very, very interested in, in all of it. You know, I'm really excited too about um, maybe some of, maybe you're familiar with or not, but you've heard about these um, um, new treatments that are out there for, for people who have diabetes or are severely obese, um, these GLP ones yes. are called like, yes. for example, um, uh, they appear to be extremely effective also in driving down inflammation and really? we do have some anecdotal, uh, evidence from women who are menopausal, who said they've never seen anything take off their menopausal weight gain, like those drugs. Um, hmm. They are extremely expensive. It does mean being on a drug for the rest of your life. And so I think many of us are thinking, well, do I really want to be on a drug for the rest of my life? And is there another path here where through diet, through nutrition, we can get a lot of those same effects? And so um, it is something we're looking pretty deeply into. Um, there's a lot of theories around possibly, you know, when you're in this postmenopausal state, going on more of an intermittent fasting 
low carb sort of diet. There also may be some good evidence out there on going on more of a plant-based diet, um, high in soy, but that, again, like all of these actually need, need more research into, um, but we're very interested in exploring it ever now because they are something we can recommend to our, to our members and see if they do have good benefits from those. We're going to be talking to Dr. Heather Hirsch again next week about oh, the oh, medication. Geez. Yeah. She, she was on years ago and we're having her back on because she's actually getting connected with um, MIDI health from MIDI. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah, and, it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, she did a, a TikTok recently about the medications. So that's why I was familiar with it. And I'm interested to follow up with her to see exactly her opinion on taking Very. the medications, but we've also, we have spoken to several experts who they just have a myriad of, of excellent, like you said, intermittent fasting seems to help, you know, we even talked to Dan Butner from the blue zones about why people live to be over a hundred and the blue zones are like five areas in the world where it's normal for people to live over to a hundred. And again, it's plant-based. He talks about beans should be in like every meal. <laughs> okay. he's, he's, a, a, he's a fan of beans yes like yeah beans, but beans. It, yeah they are very low uh meat animal meat they plant they protein. see plant based High protein 25 and to 35. It's, it's movement it's not necessarily going yeah. out and running 10 miles it's kind of an yeah. all-day thing all-day mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. do you so I, when someone gets in touch with ever now are they able do they i know well I'm going to ask you the question, even though I'm going to answer. When they contact EverNow, is it a telehealth appointment where they get to know a doctor? How does it work? So when you contact EverNow, um, you come in through the website, you go through our health intake, which is a um, very comprehensive health survey. So everything from your age, your weight, your height, when your date of your last period, if you can remember it, um, basic, basic, um, other health factors. Do you have high blood pressure? What other medications are you on? Have you had a recent surgery? Essentially kind of what you're filling out when you go to your doctor's office and, you know, fill out that long form, even though you've done it 30 times before. Um, and then we take all that information and we give it to one of our certified NAMS health pr practitioners. Um, we are making sure that all of our health providers are NAMS certified. And I think that's very, very important because I hadn't realized menopause isn't just an isolated thing. It really is a whole shift in a woman's health. And so you need to make sure you're going to a practitioner who recognizes that, which is, it isn't just like, oh, she's going through menopause. It is, oh, she's going through menopause. That means I need to think about what's going on with her cholesterol and triglycerides. That means I have to be thinking about what's going on with her bone health, her heart health, her brain health. It's really, really important that somebody has that full perspective on your body so that they can really make some good, sophisticated, informed um, um, recommendations for your health and really engage in a conversation with you that way. Um, today we are primarily asynchronous. And so what that means is you'll mostly be communicating with us on text or over email. Um, we do have the option to be able to do, for example, a phone call. We have, we do have the technical capability to do a video call. Um, that isn't part of the main service, but it is an option for women who come in, um, we give you kind of a whole health picture and health recommendation, and we're shifting our business. Um, really, we're in the middle of it right now to where um, we will recommend what treatments you might want, and then you can decide if you want those treatments or not. And primarily, they are prescription treatments, although we're starting to build out uh, a whole portfolio of non-prescription treatments. The challenge there is that we're very committed to doing everything that's evidence-based. And so we're in the middle of a project right now to go through all the various different supplements and make sure that anything we're ever recommending does have good evidence behind it. And we can tell you how strong that evidence is. So you can make a decision for yourself if you want to do it. Um, once you decide you want to be on that medication, um, you can go pick it up at a local pharmacy. We can ship it to you. Um, and then essentially we're just in a, a, a weekly, monthly conversation with you on how things are working. We try to give you a heads up on common side effects. You can contact us anytime. 
Um, we'll always get back to you within a few hours, which is, I think a lot of women appreciate, especially if you're saying like, Hey, I'm having this side effect. Is this normal? Like, do I need to worry about this? Um, and we try to get back to you, um, with a good answer very rapidly. Um, but that's, that's the core service that we provide today. Is it available in most States or is there some places it's not available? We cover 85% of the United States today. There's a few states we don't cover. Um, we will be uh, expanding out across the rest of the U.S., the, the small remaining portion, um, over the next year or so. And finally, with the when it comes to insurance, I know that it's a tricky like relationship. <laughs> so Sorry. I'm starting to see some connections between telehealth and coverage with insurance. Where yes. is Ever now at at this point? Yes. Um, so we are still a cash pay business. However, if you go and, um, for example, have your prescription treatment filled by a local pharmacy, you can use your insurance there. Um, one of the challenges um, with telehealth is we built our platform to be very efficient so that you can conveniently just text us, reply back. We can reply back and say, hey, we think this thing, yada, yada, yada. Um, the challenge with that is that most um, insurance plans do not cover that sort of communication. Um, most insurance only has reimbursement codes for an in-person visit, for being able to have a 45-minute telehealth call. Um, and that has been something that's been challenging for us because we wanted to build a service that was extremely um, convenient for women. Um, you know, that being said, we're very proud of the fact that um, we have the ability to offer it for such a low cost for most women um, because it is efficient. Can you use your flexible spending account? I couldn't, I didn't know your if that FSA was. Or your HSA. Okay. And we're developing various pricing plans right now so that we can actually fit women with different needs and different budgets. That's great. Well, we will have the link to Evernow in our show notes so they can find out more information. We appreciate your time, but thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I am so glad you're doing this podcast. I am so glad you asked me to be here. I mean, this is the most the most important thing we can be doing is getting the message out to women about what menopause is, what to expect, and what they can do about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.